It's actually three o'clock now. Um, hello, welcome everyone to FAPA Pharmacy Education section webinar. Um, the title is Pharmacy Education Beyond COVID-19, Changes, Challenges and Experiences in the Asia Pacific Countries. So I'm very happy to be moderating this session. Uh, we have six wonderful speakers in line uh, to share with you their changes and challenges and also experiences. Uh, in relation to pharmacy education. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, before we go further, I'd just like to share some general guidelines for all the participants. Um, as you would uh, notice that you are now muted, but you can still use the chat box uh, throughout the event to post questions and uh, say hi to if you see anybody uh, you know and so on. And you please use the Q&A window to ask questions. Uh, I know that we have actually uh, collected some questions uh, when you registered. So we have compiled those questions, which will appear at the end of the session. Um, I don't think I need to re uh, remind everyone to be courteous and only use respectful language uh, because we know pharmacists are. And um, this session is recorded, but we don't going to make your personal details or audio or camera visible at any time. Next one, please. Okay, before we start, I'm just going to quickly just highlight uh, about FAPA, which is uh, the Federation of Asian Pharmaceutical Associations with 24 members from, from the Western Pacific region, Southeast Asia, and also the Eastern Mediterranean region with over than 300,000 pharmacists uh, strong. And we actually host a Congress every two years. Um, next one. However, this year's uh, planned Congress uh, is postponed due to COVID-19, obviously. Uh, initially uh, scheduled 20th to the 24th of October this year, but it will be done 6th to 10th April next year. So please mark your calendar for this event and I would like on behalf of FAPA to welcome you to Kuala Lumpur. Next one. Um, there are actually seven sections in FAPA. Pharmacy education section is one of them. Um, so this section provides the venue for uh, pharmacy educators and also training professionals for sharing of ideas and also philosophies, experience particularly to improve teaching and learning strategies also in the uh, area of curriculum development, maybe some creative projects, tools and innovation so that uh, we can produce future pharmacists and pharmacists workforce meeting the changing needs of different areas of practice. Next one. So now I would like to introduce myself proper. Uh, my name is Muhammad Haniki Nik Muhammad. I go by Haniki, currently the pharmacy education section chairperson of FAPA. I'm actually uh, a lecturer at the International Islamic University Malaysia, um, having several posts uh, before and currently the head of internationalization and global network at the faculty of pharmacy. So other than curriculum development, implementation, monitoring, um, I actively uh, engage in accreditation of pharmacy schools. Um, and we hear uh, more of that later on. And I was the previous uh, principal of the Malaysian Academy of Pharmacy. Um, uh, and also uh, my area of research is particularly in tobacco control and public health pharmacy. So that's, um, that's my email down there if you need to contact me for any reasons uh, later. Next one. Okay, so this is the uh, flyer that you probably have seen during your registration earlier. And as I've said, we'll be joined, we are having six uh, distinguished speakers from different countries from Australia, uh, Malaysia itself, India, Indonesia, Philippines, and also Mongolia. So I think um, I will just go straight and then start the session by uh, going to the next slide and inviting Dr. Vivian Mike before she does a presentation. I'll just quickly read uh, bio data. She's actually a Malaysian uh, working in Australia 
uh, right now um, with academic experience in both countries. I'm currently a lecturer and simulation lead for the Vertical Integrated Masters at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences at Monash uh, University of Australia. So uh, where there's uh, OSCE uh, and also my dispense, which is an online pharmacy simulation developed by the university. So she will cover more of this uh, in her presentation shortly. She also has interest in cultural communication, lead development, online training modules, and so many other things uh, with her accolades. Uh, actually, Vivian has stepped in to be hosting the uh, webinar session uh, in lieu of the possible tornado, I think, in um, the Philippines. Although we pray that nothing will happen, uh, as you know, FAPA headquarters uh, currently being hosted in uh, the Philippines. So because uh, we want to get as many participants as possible for this webinar, uh, we're using uh, Monash to assist us with the account. So thank you so much, Vivian and Monash University for all this. And I think we can go straight and listen to uh, Vivian presentation uh, with the uh, next slide. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Haniki. Um, so, um, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to be part of this uh, session. What an amazing opportunity it is for me to present um, on behalf of what's um, happening in um, Australia. So, um, as Prof. Haniki has um, introduced me, I'm the lecturer and simulation lead at Monash University. Currently, it's at 5 p.m., so it's uh, quite a cold um, evening here um, in Melbourne. So I'm a lecturer, so I'm going to share some of my experiences in terms of a teacher's perspective on how we've adapted um, teaching and learning during um, COVID-19. So before I begin, I just want to share with you, I guess, the um, background knowledge on what the instructional model is that we use before the whole pandemic. Um, a bit of background, we have moved fully um, online. Um, so um, essentially uh, what's occurred is that um, we can no longer go back onto campus um, and our students have gone, gone fully online. Some of them are, have, have gone international, so they've gone back home um, due to the border restrictions as well. But this is the instructional model that we've used um, before the pandemic, um, which we call the DEAR model. DEAR stands for Discover, Explore, Apply and Reflect. Um, this is actually because when we, um, before the pandemic, we already were using self-directed learning. So we were quite lucky that a lot of our discovery material, so what we call pre-learning material, was already fully online. Um, then they would come to class. The, in the large class setting, we don't do didactic lectures anymore. All our lectures are interactive, whereby the students will not be learning anything specifically new but they'll be going through activities um, and case studies to apply or explore further what they've learned in their pre-learning. And I'll go through each one with you in a second. Aside from that, they will come into small group workshops. So our lectures are about 200 students each in the lecture theater. And in small group sessions, it's about 25 to 30 students in each workshop or labs. In the workshop, they will apply what they've learned in their discovery and in their interactive lectures. Um, and you apply these by going through more activities with their peers. The last component, which we call reflect. And reflect is because they will have an e-portfolio. They will constantly reflect on what they've been doing as part of a coaching session. So these are actually 10 students uh, per one academic or even a practitioner. Um, and, and as you can see, there are a few components in there whereby we will need some, um, there are challenges in associated with face-to-face -face sessions. So the interactive lectures, workshops, and also the uh, reflective component with skills coaching requires face-to-face -face time. So we have converted everything online, especially the ones um, in the lectures and workshop setting. So just to give you an idea, we use our learning management systems a lot more. And the one that we use at Monash is called Moodle. Um, and in Moodle, we will use, um, basically all our online materials are all based there. What we've tried to do is have some consistency in our delivery. So every single week of the semester, we call it a topic. So in this instance, the, this topic that I've given to you as an example is on health literacy. So we've decided to keep our instructional model and keep the discovery day. So basically they have a day on Monday, which is allocated for them to do all their pre-learning material. 
the, the lectures are going to be on Tuesday. They will have a workshop on the Thursday and also have another what we call a close the loop lecture on a Friday. And I'll go through each one with you right now with some examples. This is what we have in terms of the discovery material. So the pre-learning online material that they get. And this comes in the form of text. So they have to read um, materials or it could also come in the form of videos. One thing that the students have given me a lot of feedback on is that the videos need to have really clear instructions. So we can't just provide them with videos to watch without telling them what they're watching, how long the video is going to be, and maybe some questions for them to answer as they're progressing along. Um, we also tend to find that the videos need to be very short. So um, students tend, the attention span tends to drop when it reaches about 10 minutes. So always try to keep all your videos to be less than 10 minutes long. So this is all done in their own time with very clear instructions. They need to complete all of this before coming and doing the interactive lecture. So if we're doing it on campus, they'll come into a large class, they'll sit down in a lecture theater and you will have a lecturer, so myself there. But because our lectures are not didactic, we have a challenge here where I can't just sit here and record a lecture for the students. Um, so we've decided to do what we call like an activity-based um, recordings. So these lectures are asynchronous, meaning that it's all pre-recorded and they can watch at any time and anywhere. And this is to accommodate students who don't have internet access or maybe they're unable to log in live to a lecture. So an example here would be a short four minute video of me introducing the lecture and the learning objectives, an activity like this where they're asked to do a specific task and then they have to enter their answers. Now you may ask, do I read 200 student answers? The answer is I don't. Now the idea is that they're going to put in and have to think about what they think the answer will be for the activity. It gets stored for them to reflect upon. They need to complete this before they're given what we call a feedback video. So a feedback video is where I will record another video straight after the activity where they will watch in terms of what would the ideal answer be um, if they were to answer this question. We've taught this lecture multiple times now, so we know what are the common things that students will ask, so we incorporate that in the lecture. In terms of workshops, they do this live. They do this on Zoom, and I'm sure all of you are very familiar with Zoom by now, um, and they do what we call synchronous workshops. It is very difficult if you get all the students to come into the class without any clear instructions. So this is where the learning management system comes into play again. Uh, we make clear instructions before they come to the workshop, what they should expect, what will happen in the workshop, and if there's any submissions they require to do post-workshop. So this is a screen grab of one of our teaching associates doing a workshop with a group of 25 to 30 students. Um, and this is one of the most liked activity um, for the students. So they like being able to see their friends and interact with their peers. We then have what we call um, closed loop lectures. Now, lecture classes are 200 students. So uh, you can imagine if you have 200 students in a Zoom meeting, that's going to be quite difficult to manage. So what we're doing now today for FAFA is what we call a Zoom webinar. A Zoom webinar allows you to put in questions, um, questions into the question and answer tab. And this is what we do with our students at the end of the week to close the loop for the topic. So you will see on the left hand side, there is a poll everywhere component. Now poll everywhere is an application that you can get. Um, essentially students can pose um, anonymous questions and everyone can also upvote their questions. So you can see that there are eight students who want me to answer a particular question. So we open this poll everywhere topic for an entire week um, so that they are able to post any questions throughout the week and we'll address all of these in the closed the loop lecture. You'll notice that I've put in a COVID-19 um, picture is because we try to incorporate as much of what the practicalities of what's going on now within the pandemic as part of the teaching. And because the topic is on the health literacy, we included some of the topics around the importance of having a medicines list during the pandemic. Um, so, we, it, so they know that what they're learning is current and practical for their profession. One of the things that I oversee is OSCEs. Uh, for those who don't know what OSCEs are, they're called Objective Structured Clinical Examinations. They're basically role play examinations that you do with examiners. These are essentially very difficult to organize and very resource intensive, even though they're in um, basically in face-to-face. -face. 
doing them online is a challenge. The challenges include replicating um, what the face-to-face -face interaction is. Internet access is going to be an issue, um, especially for those who can't afford um, a lot of internet access. There's a heavy reliance on technology. There's also an academic integrity issue because you're concerned about students sharing the exam questions. And I'm assuming it's not just for OSCEs, but for a whole wide range of things as well. So some of the changes that we've made is we've turned some of our OSCEs, um, which are live, to pre-recording. So the students will have to record their own videos. And these are some examples that you see on the screen. Um, the good idea is they get to do it at home with their family members because they're currently isolated with them. So they do a video recording directly on the device. So either on the phone, everyone has a smartphone that you can record or even using video conferencing tools such as Zoom. So the middle picture that you see there are actually two students doing the task of a Zoom, recording it and also putting it as a submission. Now you may say that the students are gonna put in the perfect video. Of course, everyone wants a full mark, but the idea is that if they're practicing to the point of being quite good at what they do, that will still meet the learning outcomes. So in this particular task, they were actually educating a consumer on the importance of keeping a medicines list. So what positive thing that came out of it is that we have so many new consumers who know how to use a medicines list. So, you know, some of the pharmacy students, the sisters know how to use it now, um, our parents as well. So it's a, it's a really great task that we managed to do. So what's next is we're gonna try live OSCEs over Zoom. Um, that's going to happen in a few weeks time. So fingers crossed, everything works well for us. Um, technology is always going to fail us. And I think the really important thing as academics is to not be too hard on ourselves, that it's okay that things don't go um, as, as well as we think. We're going to use the waiting room and breakout rooms functionality in Zoom to mimic OSCE stations. Um, so I'll let you know a little bit more, I guess, once I finished um, trialing this live OSCE. And finally, I just want to end my presentation with a virtual pharmacy simulation that Monash University has created about nine years ago. It's called My Dispense. Um, you can look it up online. It is a free simulation that we share and we use it not just at Monash University, but we share it freely um, around the world. Around 150 universities now use it from uh, the US, the UK, um, Africa, and also in Asia. Um, I've seen some of the Asian Pacific um, partners who've also adopted this simulation. So it's there for you if you're interested. By all means, you can contact us at my dispense on Twitter or also contact me as well. Um, so that's the end of my presentation and I'll pass this back on to um, Professor Haniki. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, for sticking to time, the 10 minutes, uh, and sharing with us uh, some of the changes and innovations at Monash, uh, particularly OSCE and also my dispense. I'm sure the participants will, uh, who are interested to get more details can contact you uh, directly. And uh, again, just a quick reminder, as I have gone over this earlier, for those who have just joined us, you can use the Q&A window to ask questions. And... Um, uh, We'll have the questions and answer sessions also at the end of all the speakers' presentations. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay. Um, uh, we're going to go with this listing. Uh, we've just had uh, Vivian, so now we're moving on to Malaysian's very own uh, Associate Professor Dr. Muhammad Zulkifli Muhammad Jusof, who is the Muhammad Jusof, is the current Dean of the School of Pharmacy at the International Medical University uh, in Malaysia. Uh, he's a pharmaceutical chemistry uh, by profession and also current principal of the Malaysian Academy of Pharmacy, as well as the appoint one of the appointed members of the Pharmacy Board Malaysia. He serves as a panel for accreditation uh, under the Malaysian Qualification Agency of Pharmacy Related Programs. So the floor is yours, uh, Prof. Zul. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so as introduced, I'm Zul. And uh, thank you again to Prof. Haniki uh, for the kind introduction. So I try to stick to the allocated uh, times, 10 minutes, uh, with my presentation here. And uh, firstly, uh, my appreciation to FAPA 
and uh, MPS, as well as uh, to Monash University uh, for the kind uh, sponsorship of uh, this uh, Zoom account. And um, so uh, I'm going to use this opportunity to share the experience or what have been done so far in uh, pharmacy education in Malaysia in terms of uh, changes and uh, challenges during and beyond this COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, before I move further, um, it was to share here maybe um, what is the current situation of this pandemic in Malaysia. So as the last uh, uh, report uh, by Ministry of Health Malaysia on 40th May, uh, there are cumulative uh, 6,800 cases reported so far, where uh, 5,300 uh, recovered cases and uh, still 1,300 uh, cases are active. So the average of new cases in the past four weeks have been reported around the double digit number and uh, we yet to see it drop to a single digit. So Malaysia has been under the uh, fifth phase of uh, movement control order, MCO, which uh, the first phase has started since uh, March um, 18th. And uh, as of today, uh, we are almost uh, two months uh, with this uh, restriction movement situation. So what has happened during this time to our educational system? Generally, all learning institutions, including universities, um, ordered to close the operation and only allowed to do the teaching and learning activity via the online platform from our respective resident or home. So in this webinar, I'm going to share on how we in Malaysia are dealing with these changes um, from Malaysia perspective. Um, next slide, please. So before I share further on the initiative or alternative taken by pharmacy institution in Malaysia, I would like to introduce here to audience in this region briefly about pharmacy education in Malaysia. So generally, the pharmacy degree in Malaysia is regulated by the Pharmacy Board Malaysia, or you can see in the Malay, Malaysia language spellings, uh, Lembaga Farmasi Malaysia, uh, which is under Ministry of Health. So generally, the pharmacy degree in Malaysia regulated by this Pharmacy Board Malaysia under the Registration of Pharmacists Act 1951. And this covered from approval to conduct the program monitoring how the institution is running the program until the pharmacist training of the fresh graduate and issuing the pharmacist license. So at the moment, uh, 21 institutions are offering a four-year program where five of them are public or government universities, while the rest are either local private or foreign private institution. So here all institutions must conduct their program following the latest standard on approval and recognition of pharmacy program 2018, which is a document issued by the pharmacy board. So the program is designed in such to prepare a student for basic and advanced knowledge in the practice of pharmacy, pharmaceutical chemistry, uh, and uh, pharmacology, pharmaceutical technology, such as design and manufacturing. Also professional competency and attitude uh, that required as a pharmacy graduate. So the educational process involves theoretical and practical knowledge, self-development learning, and uh, towards the end, uh, the work-based experiential learning, which involves collaboration with partners from hospitals, community, pharmacies, and industry. So now in this pandemic environment, how the institution is going to respond in regard to physical and movement restriction while we still need to running the program. So turn to the next slide. So as the pharmacy program here is regulated by the pharmacy board, during this pandemic, all institutions here are to keep following the guidelines produced by the board. And this guideline must be read together with the other guideline by the Ministry of Higher Education and other relevant authorities such as Ministry of Health. As a summary, the conduct of the program during this uh, movement control order or MCO, as well as the post MCO would be, the institution should follow the standards on approval and recognition of pharmacy program 2018, 
as well as the Ministry of Higher Education and the Malaysian Qualifications Agency, MQA, which is the body that uh, accredit the program, education program in Malaysia. And uh, the institution also requested to switch all teaching and learning into online delivery as an alternative with some flexibility based on the guidelines by the MQA dated on 29th March 2020. The institution should take action to modify their teaching and learning component from face-to-face -face into fully online, depending on the readiness of students, academic staff, resources, as well as their facilities. So we've been given uh, quite ample time um, to uh, probably uh, improve or uh, make modification to our existing system. And uh, for practical component, the institution could conduct it via video recording, virtual simulation or other available remote method. And um, some uh, methods are actually uh, been shared by Dr. Vivian just now. And the institution also allowed to make adjustment on the assessment and evaluation, including the in-course assessment based on the student learning time or the credit hour, which uh, achieve at least minimum 80% of it and uh, so that it can be considered as achieve the credit requirement during this pandemic period. So that's not to burden uh, the faculty to really uh, conduct the teaching and learning um, to the full 100%. So next slide please. So the guidelines continue for the experiential learning, attachment and assessment here in this slide. So the institution also allowed to rearrange the duration and time in uh, fulfilling the minimum standard of the hospital pharmacy, community pharmacy and uh, industrial pharmacy attachment. Alternatively, we also allowed uh, using video lab simulation, a mock pharmacy pilot plan, virtual simulation or any other suitable resources to cover some component in the attachment that could achieve the learning outcomes of the program. Uh, for the assessment, especially high stake exam can be uh, replaced with take home exam or open book exam, online examination, etc. depending on the suitability, um, including the OSCE online uh, as introduced by Dr. Vivian. And the institution also is advised to ensure the examination conducted in the remote or online environment that can assess the student learning outcome while we also need to look at uh, some aspect of uh, validity, reliability and fairness because the students are taking the exam in uh, many different environments. So next slide, please. So now how about the readiness uh, of uh, all institutions in Malaysia to these changes and um, are there challenges that might be occurring? So for online learning, all institutions equipped with their e-learning facilities and platform since this is already in the program standard. So um, meaning to say that uh, we are somehow quite ready when uh, come to these changes. And some institutions have uh, already practicing uh, recorded mass lecture, etc. So there is not much uh, challenging in this. Alternatively, for a mass lecture, some applications uh, like live lecturing, uh, synchronous Microsoft Teams and VoiceOver PowerPoint were used and for small group tutorial applications like uh, synchronous Microsoft Teams, uh, Zoom, WhatsApp uh, could be applied. Having said that, um, on the challenges, there is still some limitation like some e-learning materials that only using the intranet platform. Uh, for example, uh, um, structural modeling uh, with related to the pharmaceutical chemistry. So in this case, uh, probably required a license upgrading to make it available outside the campus. Also challenges in terms of uh, connection stability that much depend on the internet providers and the area of the resident. And this also highlighted by Dr. Vivian in the case of Australia. So for skill-based uh, teaching and learning, for example, uh, lab practical, Alternatively, we can use the videos and educational online resources, for example, Labsters and uh, MyDispense. 
uh, live discussions during skills development session via Microsoft Teams, etc. And we also allowed or given a flexibility to actually rescheduling some highly required skill based practical in the following semester. For example, it is very important to the students to learn it uh, by themselves. So we allowed uh, by the board to reschedule it um, in the following uh, semester when things are getting better. Um, and alternatively, we also encourage to give a non-lab based uh, research project like reviewing article for especially the final year project. Having said that, uh, we acknowledge that there are limited online resources that meet the learning objective and uh, outcomes. And uh, actually many students feedback that they pre still prefer the hands-on practical more, especially for practical under the uh, pharmaceutical sciences like pharmaceutical chemistry, pharmaceutics and uh, pharmacology. Um, next slide, please. So moving on uh, is the readiness and uh, challenges for experiential learning um, attachment for final or clinical year. Some universities in Malaysia, mainly the public universities, have their university teaching hospital. They also have their community pharmacy or mock pharmacy and uh, a few got their own uh, pilot plants uh, for the pharmaceutical uh, industry. So these facilities could cover some of the learning objective uh, required um, under this um, component. And alternatively, we also can use videos and uh, online material of some clinical practices, video of patient counseling and lab or manufacturing simulation. Having said that, there are also some challenges uh, such as uh, for the hospital attachment um, because some of the government hospital which uh, we usually engage them uh, for this uh, clinical attachment they are now also used as the COVID-19 hospitals and they are not accepting any students attachment at the moment so for other hospitals uh, because of social physical distancing practice there be a limited number of students so here, um, what we see is the rescheduling uh, may require for this attachment. So the social physical distancing also may apply to other attachment placement like uh, in the community pharmacies as well as the pharmaceutical industry. And uh, finally, on the assessment examination, as per the guidelines by the Pharmacy Board of Malaysia, most of the institutions are converting their final semester examination into open book exam or online examination, assignment, etc. So some high stake uh, or skill testing required examination like OSCE uh, will also possibly be conducted by using online application and technology to replace the conventional way of using human resource and uh, partly already uh, shared by uh, Dr. Vivian uh, in the case of Monash University. And uh, again, having said that, uh, we could not deny that the challenges like connection stability during conduction of online assessment may happen. And uh, the other challenges is for the institution to do readjustment level of questions for open book examination um, to handle plagiarisms and fairness uh, in the non proctored environment. Uh, should that happen. So um, that's uh, the end of my sharing about how we uh, pharmacy institution in Malaysia in general currently handling the program in this pandemic situation where we still need to maintain the outcome of the program as per the standard. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, next slide. Thank you, Prago, for the uh, sharing. You. And I think some of your uh, key points uh, are already addressing some of the questions that we are receiving in the chat box and also the uh, earlier questions by uh, participants. Uh, so we move on in the interest of time to the next uh, presenter. Can we have this next slide? Okay, um, next we have from India, Dr. G. Sumalata, who's a professor and vice principal of the Vikas Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences. And after gaining her teaching experience uh, from Hindu College of Pharmacy, she is uh, actively involved in professional organizations, uh, also with the Pharmacy Association and at school of the FIP. 
So she, she's an advocate for women in leadership and education and uh, was given the best communication training by Elite Women 2019. So please, uh, Dr. Sumanatha, in the next 10 minutes, share with us your challenges and experience for pharmacy education in India. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Professor Haniki, Papa members, Mac, uh, Christine, and all other speakers for your support. So today, uh, we shall proceed for discussing about COVID-19 pandemic, so which converted didactic teaching to digital teaching. And I would like to mention a few uh, opportunities, challenges, and key points which is facing by pharmacy education in India, especially in next slide, please. So now the status of uh, pharmacy profession in our India is we have uh, around 4,500 institutions, including universities, uh, college schools, like government and private schools. And the students are around 1.5 million. So from different kinds of uh, courses like the pharmacy, B pharmacy, M farm and farm And uh, we have 60,000 teachers around our country. So you name in the categories like professors, associate professors, and assistant professors. Next slide, please. So uh, according to our India, the present levels of pharmacy education is uh, like in four in five, uh, five kinds of things like uh, diploma. We are offering diploma course, uh, which is of comprises of two years, and bachelor of pharmacy of four years, and farm D. So uh, it is of six years course. So an M pharmacy, which is included as a PG of two years and PhDs. So present we have registrable qualifications under this Pharmacy Act 1948. Next slide, please. And the curriculum of our UG and PG pharmacy course in our India, uh, how it suits is like it has given a pictorial representation, like 60% of pharmaceutical sciences is in the industry. And whereas practice 10% and humanities 10 and medical sciences 10 and others 10. And our Pharmacy Council of India has taken some initiatives. So now we are following uniform syllabus uh, entire country and we have separated the regulations and we are preparing the students of both UG and PG to meet the industry needs of pharmaceutical sector. And also farm, we are training farm to meet the pharmacy practice needs of our country. So it is purely about uh, quality uh, education based output. So coming to the impact of this COVID-19 crisis uh, on pharmacy education in our India. So yeah, as like all the countries, uh, really we face tough time. So till today we are facing, I um, mean, we are uh, finding out the cases of this COVID-19. And but so we can feel better when compared to uh, even more poor countries. But our pharmacy program, as you all of you know, it's a very noble profession, which mainly contributes to the societal uh, health needs. And a good pharmacist need to be a good compound derived from sound knowledge and skills. So, so here we need more skills and practical oriented teaching. So like when compared to unlike all the arts and other groups, so here pharmacy required uh, wet lab, instrumental analysis, or like field oriented uh, learning, like if you supposed to take hospitals pharmacy section. So here we need to have a field oriented learning mainly. So, but this COVID-19 interrupted all the pharmacy students learning relatively with higher magnitude in any other program. So, but the digital India, was a vision emerged as a I mean, vital instrument in solving all the problem crisis in all these sectors, including education. The COVID-19 mandate to experiment and it is requiring new tools to maintain the education in the same quality uh, to reach the students in a meaningful way. And but we are facing few challenges and there are few missing components because of this uh, digital learning. So that is, there is no face-to-face -face and personal communication between the students and teachers. And we don't know the student well-being and uh, uh, we are facing challenges in teaching moral values, ethics and level of understanding and sincerity and dedication of the students. 
and especially speaking about the stress on students and staff members especially Hi, we seem to have uh, some technical problem with Dr. Sumalata. Uh, I think we are having some technical difficulties with Dr. Sumalata. Um, is she back with us or she's having problem with her connection? I'm not sure. Um, so she has some more slides to go through, right? Uh, if we can see the next slides. Okay, so um, here she outlined the guidelines to be followed by colleges. I think this is also uh, one of the uh, questions that uh, we got uh, to know how each country, uh, if there are any guidelines to be followed by colleges or faculties uh, for teaching and learning during and post COVID-19. So uh, this, is, this slide is uh, going to be helpful for those who are interested to know more about the safety issue, the uh, physical uh, requirements, and also uh, some of the uh, requirements uh, listed there for travel and stay history, or even getting the temperature of the students if they ever come into the faculty. Next, please. So these are some of the breakdown for the teaching and learning process. Um, also, as mentioned by the previous speakers, to uh, make it more accessible, deliverable, and also more discussion-based. So the small groups is the way to go. And making sure that the study materials are actually provided uh, beforehand. So I see that the Sumalata is uh, back on. OK, uh, so I'll pass back I'm to her. Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, no there is, I think, some network error. Yeah, Go so ahead. the te yeah. teaching learning uh, process currently in our India is like, so we should divide the syllabus into small topics and we can go for discussion by making into small groups of students and we can pay more attention on each and every individual student. And pre-circulation of the study material before the day, uh, if we circulate the material to the students so that they can learn all the introductory and fundamental topics from that subject. So uh, the next day, if we uh, share the lecture, so they can listen carefully and they can do the best. And the formative quiz assessments before starting the assigned topics uh, can be done so that we can increase the thinking ability of the students and we can increase the I mean, learning nature in the students. And the assignments with problem-based learning is very important because uh, we're not reading like a theoretical part regularly, whatever present in the books. If you give an assignment with a problem-based learning like case studies, in case of pharmacy practice, case study, or any experimental uh, assignments, and which is uh, problem-based, so it can be it can improve the understanding of the levels of the students actually. And videos on some topics and assessment of the ability of the understanding of the student, especially student specific. And group discussions on specific course outcome also will helpful in teaching learning process. Next slide. And, and like the syllabus is divided into different topics, like we can divide the students in a class into different groups and batches. A minimum of 15 students can be uh, mentored by a uh, teacher. So, so that we can teach them both theoretically and practically, we can make them ready for, for theory and practical levels. We need to convert the teaching resources into digital platform. This is the main challenge uh, now in front of us because of this COVID-19. But we need to cover 25% of the syllabus by this digital platform. But for the I mean, completeness of this remaining 75%, we 100% we need to teach them face-to-face -face teaching. The concern affiliating universities in our country, especially, so they have their own uh, 
addition of the syllabus in apart from this pharmacy council of india syllabus so these universities or schools or colleges need to add some exact e content information and they need to upload in their website so that colleges can share these digital resources to all the students who are studying in the school the laboratory assignments and practicals through virtual labs can be shared to all the students but there won't be any experiential experiential learning but in such a way we can try because of this videos and virtual labs and the internal examinations uh, for this period this covid 19 pandemic period so we need to conduct online so now we are conducting online in our university and schools so we are conducting online by giving assignments and problem based thinking and we are uh, assessing the understanding and thinking ability of the students uh, you I mean uh, like through this online examination but coming to the annual examinations uh, it need to be decided by the university in due course of time next slide please so at the outset uh, i'll be always grateful to our national president indian pharmaceutical association dr t narayana for his support and kindness it would be impossible to count all the ways that he helped so many people like me in our careers thank you everyone thank you for the patience now i pass on this presentation to professor thank Hanson. you so much thank, thank you to manasa for your sharing uh so next we'll move on to the um next presenter from indonesia uh, i i noticed a lot of questions uh, came in to uh, regarding the lab based uh, alternatives for uh, for the students so uh professor uh, dr ago andro uh, nugroho will is currently dean of faculty of pharmacy at the uh, Pharmacology and Clinical Pharmacy Department of Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. His expertise is in molecular pharmacology, and with numerous publications, patents, achievement in research. Uh, also a member of Ethics and Discipline Council of the Indonesian Pharmacists Association, as well as Vice President for Academic Affairs of the Association of Indonesian Pharmacy Higher Education, and the Board of Director for the Asian Association of Schools of Pharmacy. and member of the pharmacy education research network of asean so i i would like to invite prof dr ajo to share his presentation with us yeah uh, thank you very much uh, ladies and gentlemen good afternoon everyone yeah uh, first of all i would like to say thank you very much yeah firstly for part of director of fapa uh, part member of fapa Uh, and a special thanks for Dr. Haniki to facilitate us in the uh, FAPA webinar now. And also special thanks for Monash University to support the yeah, uh, FAPA webinar through uh, Zoom facility today. Okay, uh, today I would like to, how to say, share our academic uh, activities during uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia, especially in uh, our university, Universitas Gajah Mada. Next slide. Yeah, uh, no, I would like to start with uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0. It is uh, closely to challenge of pharmacy higher education, the era of technological disruption. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are facing in uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0 or Education 4.0. This era is uh, closely related to cyber physical system, Internet of Things, and network. And, and there are three uh, new literacies related to Industrial Revolution 4.0. The first data literacy, it is ability to read, analyze, and use information. big data in digital things. And the second one, technology literacy, understanding the workings of machines, technology applications, such as coding, artificial intelligence, and engineering principles. And the last one, human literacy or soft skill literacy. It is related to humanities, adaptive skills, communication skills, design, 
soft skills, social skills, and etc. Yeah, next, uh, to follow up the points, our government, Indonesian government, release policies. For example, about curriculum reorientation, hybrid learning, establishing lifelong learning unit, and providing grants and technical guidance services for curriculum reorientation for 400 university. Related to curriculum reorientation, uh, it is very related to new uh, literacy, extracurriculum activities in order to develop the leadership skill and teamwork skill should be implemented. Entrepreneurship and internship is uh, compulsory. So from this, uh, it is uh, very important to reorient the curriculum in short uh, soft skill, data and technology literacies. And also it is about hybrid blended learning online. I mean that uh, it is very important to combine between conventional learning and teaching method with uh, modern uh, methods, online teaching learning. Okay, next. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, and how to internalize these points of uh, industrial revolution 4.0 in curriculum. In my case, ladies and gentlemen, we set up new curriculum in 2017. Total credit 445 credit, and in this uh, curriculum, based on FAPA recommendation. Yeah, life sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, pharmaceutical industry, clinical pharmacy, and social pharmacy. This one pillar from uh, FAPA recommendation. In order to internalize uh, Industrial Revolution 4.0, uh, we inserted uh, courses of soft skills for credit in a uh, curriculum, and then a course of digital transformation three credits to support incorporate uh, data and technological literacies. And also we exposure with co-curricular program every semester to strengthen soft skill of uh, students. For example, character building, English communication skills, public speaking, socio entrepreneurship, professionalism, leadership, and ethics. So that we do is that the graduate from uh, how to say new curriculum can get a new literacy of uh, industrial revolution 4.0, soft skill, data, and technological literacies. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Yeah. And how about uh, university's policy on the COVID-19 pandemic? Ladies and gentlemen, mid-March, Indonesian government declares the coronavirus pandemic as a national disaster. And soon, my university released statement of rector about emergency response concerning COVID-19 in our university. And principally, uh, my university restricts mobility to and from overseas, requests all staff members and students to keep staying at home. I mean work from home and teaching and learning from home during the emergency response periods. And about academic policy, my university uh, suggests to replace all academic activities in campus and classes including practicum with online activities. So all of uh, academic activities are changed with online activities. And like lecturers to conduct consultation and examination activities by online and use the available system and applications that are already provided and developed by my university and optimize the existing information technology, IT-based academic system that are developed by university, and cancels any academic activities involving many people, for example, graduate ceremony, international conference, that are changed with online system, for example, online graduation ceremony, 
online international conference and etc. Yeah, next. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to continue implementation of online uh, teaching and learning activities in my uh, faculty, yeah, faculty of pharmacy, Universitas Gadjah Mada. I would like to start with lecturing activities, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Lecturing activities, online learning and teaching must consider courses learning outcomes because uh, learning outcome is uh, the most important to do uh, academic activities. So after, uh, how to say, COVID-19 pandemic subsets, we would like to evaluate the implementation of online learning teaching and we follow up with uh, how to say class program or workshop to achieve the learning outcome and team teaching use flip classroom method or blended learning i mean uh, how to say uh, we focus to implement online uh, teaching and learning methods and le uh, lecturing method use synchronous methods for example, Webex, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype, Google Meets, and etc. And asynchronous methods, for example, universities e learning, Elisa, Ila, and etc. Material are given previously uh, to students using e learning so that students can study at home. Synchronous method, we can communicate directly with students, but asynchronous methods, we cannot. So, uh, from asynchronous methods, uh, lectures can upload materials, for example, a recorded video, a material PowerPoint, and uh, assignment, quiz, and etc. Lecturers can make learning and teaching video and then upload either YouTube and asynchronous methods, university learning, for example, ILISA, ELO, and etc and combines with communication by email, social media groups, faculty websites, and other forms. About student assessment is carried out using the learning management system developed by the university or other system. That is the preference of lecturers and students. And we use academic information system through semester, yeah, integrated university information system or COBA, Outcome Based Assessment Information System. Next. Okay, and how about practicum? Uh, laboratory practices, yeah, replaced by online methods, yeah, such as online simulation, dry labs, videos, lab case studies, and etc. And about uh, thesis for bachelor program, Research is recommended using review methods, for example, narrative review, evidence review, systematic review. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, especially for PESEL program, uh, actually, narrative review is uh, suitable yeah, method, I think, for PESEL program, uh, rather than evidence review and systematic review. Or we also suggest uh, survey data collection. I mean data collection, use online searching by online database, website, internet, and etc. Whoever, a master, a for master and PhD program, students are not yet permitted to work in the faculty laboratory until the COVID-19 infection pandemic subsets with considering some academic dispensation. Special for master program, of clinical pharmacy and master program of pharmacy management who have not finished the proposal, it is recommended to be switched to suffer data collection methods, for example, uh, from website, online, and etc. For proposal and final thesis examination, we conduct online examination. Okay, next. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to continue to professional working practices yeah? uh, in Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen. In the curriculum bachelor, uh, it is for years and after graduate from a bachelor program, 
the student uh, continue to professional educational program. In a professional educational program, mostly the student do internship and how to change uh, the professional working practices. Uh, it is very difficult, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, to achieve the learning outcome. At least we minimize, I think, the gap of uh, how to say achievement of learning outcome. In order to get this purpose, we do some how to say programs, for example, sharing content methods via videos and presentation, making learning videos yeah, in uh, industry, pharmacies, or apotek yeah, in Indonesia names, hospitals, health centers, and etc. So uh, we make a video activities yeah, in industry and uh, apotek or pharmacies, uh, hospitals, health centers, and etc. And we also add additional activities, yeah, group sharing. In the group sharing, discussion groups involving field supervisor, preceptors, or practitioners, and students who have done professional working practices, and we uh, ask the students to present, yeah, the explain uh, about uh, professional working practices, and also involve the student who have not have done professional working practices and also we do online teaching and learning by practitioners and preceptors and the last one about graduation we uh, conducted a ceremonial graduation by online i think uh, it is enough our presentation ladies and gentlemen thank you very much uh, yeah i will give thanks to dr hanigi thank you Thank you so much, uh, Professor Agum uh, from Indonesia for the sharing session and also addressing uh, the most popular questions regarding um, industrial or lab based or experiential based like uh, or going to the industry or the hospitals. Uh, so it seems that we need to use uh, other methods uh, as uh, shared just now by Prof Agum. So next one, we're going to hear from Dr. Arwin martinez Faller from uh, San Pedro College, Davao, who is the Director of Internationalization and Linkages. He's a registered pharmacist, uh, very well versed in education, hospital community, and also NGOs. Um, he's also a visiting professor to the UK, a distinguished fellow uh, for Singapore, associate member, for the National Research Council at, in the Philippines and founder of the Global Health Pharmacy Network in Asia. He's an editor for many of the journals, uh, local and abroad, a prolific writer and a recipient of many international academic scholarships, grants, and also recently awarded uh, a professor by uh, Bagong Bayani Award for Outstanding Employee. So with that, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Erwin to uh, share his experience from the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Erwin, you need to unmute the mic. It is still muted. Uh, Dr. Arwin. Dr. Arwin, uh, you need to unmute, unmute your mic. I uh, hope everyone can bear with us for um, a few minutes when we um, we're trying to uh, trying to 
resolve this technical issue with uh, Dr. Elwin. Uh, we can't seem to unmute his mic for some reason. So hold on for, for a minute. As I mentioned earlier, um, there's a typhoon a warning uh, for the south of Philippines. So I hope this is not um, the effect of the typhoon, uh, maybe approaching the area. I hope not. But uh, let's see if we can get Dr. Erwin to uh, unmute his mic quickly. If not, um, maybe uh, we can go to the next presenter from Mongolia first, and then we'll see if we can come back to uh, Dr. Erwin later. Is that possible? So we have uh, two presenters actually from Mongolia. We have Prof. Dolzba and also Ms. Zaya. Um, but first, I'm just going to briefly introduce Prof. Dorj Bal, who's a professor at the School of Pharmacy of the Mongolian National University of Medical Sciences and a member of several expert committees on drug and pharmaceuticals uh, at the uh, Ministry of Health Mongolia. She's also the president of the Mongolian Association of United Pharmaceutical Organization and member of the Scientist Board of School of Pharmacy. Her co-presenter is uh, Ms. Zaya, the Officer of Undergraduate Training Division of Educational Policy and Management of the same university. So I will invite both presenters from Mongolia to share. Yes. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to appreciate the organizers of FAPA and Professor Haniki, Professor Christine, Viviana, and all of the particip participants from uh, the countries. So uh, today uh, we have a great opportunity for sharing experience during this COVID situation. So now in Mongolia, we have and 60 infectious people with COVID-19 and now they've uh, recovered 20 people for now. So I will introduce about the COVID situation in Mongolian pharmacy schools. Next slide please. In Mongolia we have um, four school of pharmacies. And one of them is our school. It's the School of Pharmacy, Mongolian National University of Medical Sciences. It's a governmental school. Uh, three other, all the private schools. Uh, in Mongolia, we have uh, 1,569 pharmacy students and 125 lecturers. We have um, three kinds of undergraduate programs in Mongolian pharmacy schools. Uh, it's a pharmacist of five years and 180 credits, accelerated pharmacist in three and plus three. It's a 100 credits, pharmacy technician. Uh, the program is 104 credits. Uh, graduate program in Mongolia, master and doctoral degree and post-graduation subspecialty program we have. It's a clinical pharmacist, pharmacy drug inspectors, pharmacist, pharmaceutical technologist in traditional medicine. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, now in Mongolia, we have goal in this situation of COVID-19. First, uh, all pharmacy schools foremost to ensure the safety of our employees and the students. Uh, provide online classes to the entire undergraduate and graduate students. Considering the most recent news and announcements from WHO and the government of Mongolia, offered extended sick leave for our employees, lecturers, and arrange a flexible schedule. And then these all precautionary measures have been taken to limit the potential speed of the COVID-19. 
COVID-19 infectious to support our students and employees in this challenging time. Next slide, please. Next slide. In Mongolia, we have a uh, um, policy regarding online courses, e-learning centers and uh, multimedia centers and IT centers all working together in this situation. Uh, we follow the regulations including Mongolian law of education and Mongolian law of health. And all pharmacy schools having their uh, own orders regarding to this situation. Um, order for providing e-learning e training and standards, order for education technology and quality monitoring, order for pre-medical courses, uh, and policy for student assessment, evidence in the research-based online courses uh, are developing now. Next slide, please. Next slide. Now, e-learning centers activities is online courses and meetings, taking computer-based tests, online courses for the health professionals in the rural areas, upload online medical courses for the population and health professionals with open access, cooperation between local and, uh, and international universities to give medical education for the whole population as well. And multimedia studio operators, they prepare online courses with high sound and video quality, working on course videos, produces uh, digitizing videos for the university and other health organizations. E-learning cabinets of next next slide, please. Next slide, please. In January 27th, the Mongolian governmental order was established. It's an educational online system during COVID-19 situation. And after that, in uh, last five months, we have lots of problems uh, during in this situations, but we still using e-learning centers, cyber universities, and Google, Google Suits, xCloud, Zoom, Google Meeting, Skype, Join Me, and this kind of programs in uh, web access we are using. Now in pharmaceutical sector, we have 1,500 users, um, 42,000 accesses every day, and 850 uh, participants every day um, participating in this e-learning. For example, um, 51 subjects of pharmaceutical sciences were included in, uh, in e-learning, and 2,100 video lecturers contents in 5.7 million emails, and 8,000 video conferences, 2,000 online classrooms, and there are lots of files shared and posts were used every day. In Mongolia, a lot of students using personal computers. It's a 56.8% of students using personal computers and 42.6% uh, using smartphones and others using the tablets. Next slide, please. Next slide. Problems regarding online educational process during COVID-19 situation. Lack of internet access in this distance in the rural area. Because in Mongolia, we have lots of square kilometers, but uh, very few population. It's a three million populations. Uh, regarding e-learning, Face-to-face -face communication must be substituted with another 
a method of communication, for example, Google meetings, Skype, video chats, discussion boards, and Google Classroom uh, to deal with the negative effects associated with the lack of face-to-face -face communication during online learning. Also, researchers have demonstrated successful examples of peer feedback systems uh, in online learning, uh, which could be a potential solution to the problem of limited uh, student feedback in e-learning. Additionally, this uh, disadvantage of e-learning is sometimes solved through video chats with professors. And second, enhanced of capacity internet server. Uh, with that, in Mongolia, um, help with the information technology departments of the pharmacy schools are helping with that. Um, third, online learning is inaccessible to the computer illiterate population. Also, face-to-face um, -face communication lacks. The students uh, uh, um, suggested that the discount of data content of payment of mobile phones for students is very needed. And seminar practice subjects assessment is very poor now. In insufficiency of e-textbooks, online student feedback is limited. Online instructors tend to focus on theory rather than practice. Next slide, please. We, we recognize that with the constantly changing COVID-19 situation around the world, this is an unprecedented time for everyone, a time that for many is filled with uncertainty. Our hearts and thoughts go out to each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Darjba, uh, for sharing the wonderful initiatives taken in Mongolia. Um, we actually uh, do not get Dr. Erwin uh, to join us due to uh, technical issues. He's here, but uh, for some reason, his presentation, um, he cannot do his, his live presentation. But fortunately, we anticipated uh, this matter. Is he back? It yes. seems that like you're, you're back. Ah, okay, good. Okay, we actually have a recording of his presentation, but since he's able to do it, um, so we'll go back to uh, Dr. Erwin. He's already introduced. So let's uh, go straight in. Dr. Erwin, go ahead. Thank you very much, Prof. Haniki, and to our pharmacy educators and co-pharmacists, good afternoon. I mean, uh, here in the Philippines, it's a typhoon. And at my back, it's actually uh, a horn, uh, it's actually the dog is barking. You know? So uh, to all, good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank FAPA for organizing this very relevant and very timely webinar on pharmacy education, especially in COVID-19. I would like also to recognize the Philippine Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, who are here, headed by Dr. Alep and its members and the deans, and also our mother organization, the Philippine Pharmacists Association. In the Philippines, according to the Commission on Higher Education, there are more than 104 pharmacy schools in the country offering a four-year undergraduate program. And some universities are actually offering PharmD and also clinical pharmacy program for five years and six years for PharmD. Uh, this actually also having different uh, dif different universities also offer different postgraduate programs with this during the during this time of covid-19 uh, there are memorandum from the commission on higher education to have online learning and of course to suspend classes because most of the um, most of the affected areas are in Manila area and some are in the Visayas and of course in Mindanao. So we need to suspend our classes also. 
during COVID-19 pandemic, most of the colleges and universities do online classes to compensate the face-to-face -face classroom settings. With this, uh, we have actually uh, generate what we call as a preliminary study to identify the quality of pharmacy learnings, the challenges and opportunities uh, during and beyond COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines. We have also done this uh, study with different Asian countries, and uh, I'm going to focus more on the Philippine program. Now, we have asked students and also faculties from different universities in survey and an interview uh, in this country to take part of this research. And we have found out that there are almost a 280 respondents and getting more and more actually filling up the surveys that we had. And we found out that most of the online platform that they actually been used by the students and by the faculty are Google Classroom, Zoom, and of course, and Moodle. So these are actually free online that, that they actually been used. So this very creative, the faculty in the Philippines to use with this uh, online programs that they have. And some of the well-established universities and colleges do have their learning management system where they can upload their lecture notes, not, uh, recorded videos, and others. 83%, now take note that 83% of the universities and colleges do online learning, now online learning, uh, because there are suspensions of classes, but most of these universities now, are actually having online uh, classes amidst the COVID-19. Based on our study that there are overall quality of uh, pharmacy learning is moderately effective. No? This actually means that there are variables, efforts, example with satisfaction, interaction, accessibility, health, balance, no? that these variable efforts must be concentrated on accessibility and health balance of students to keep them abreast with the new normal of online learning. If the students have higher accessibility and healthy balance, then this will strongly affect online instruction. So if we increase more connectivity of students, then uh, 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 trying to help them in terms of connectivity, then it will actually increase in terms of the quality of pharmacy learnings that they have. And thus, there's a need for more connectivity and adjustment of modalities and uploaded notes uh, of our of notes and videos you know, of our lecturers. So there must be a training for uh, teachers, you know, for lecturers you know, of pharmacy uh, for the next semesters that we have. And this must be uh, considered upon enrollment of the students for the next semester because we're already going to end our second semester and going moving forward to the summer classes and to the first semester of of classes but most of the students really appreciate and they are satisfied on the online learnings and the efforts of uh, of our pharmacy lectures and i really congratulate it uh, for the students because they exerted really amidst the COVID-19 pandemic that brings them more engagement and interactions and they love to see they, they really now appreciate no this the, the lecturer is seeing them and with their classmates amidst all. And this becomes therapeutic for the student because some of them suffer from anxiety, stress, they are being depressed, no? alone. No? And based on the study on this slide, that the overall quality of the pharmacy, the pharmacy learning is moderately effective as what we all know. But on this slide, there are 37% of students have low bandwidth or connectivity below. 3 Mbps and 15% in high bandwidth of above 10 Mbps. And most of the students are having moderately connectivity of 3 to 10 Mbps. So there are 48% who have this in the middle. But most of the lecturers can send PDF notes, as you can see, YouTube, depending upon the immediacy, no? how immediate it is. No? When, you, when you actually give a PowerPoint slide, you don't actually immediately tell the students that on the next day, you will have a quizzes for the student. So there will be ample time for the student, a week or two, to read their, your slide because we never know, same as I, 
uh, same as what I have here, the connectivity in terms of the typhoon and other factors may be affected. So most of the lecturers send their PDF notes, you know, uh, Microsoft, uh, we conducted actually this 555 program in the faculty we're in. We have five pages of Microsoft Word to be given to the student except of those uh, figures and pictures so that it will not hang up you know, in terms of the uploading of the students. With the next slide, you can see that there are best practices of our Filipino farm pharmacy lecturers here that adaptability of the faculty and being resilient and engaging to the student. We, the, the Filipino pharmacy educators uh, really are more, uh, really are engaging no, to the students. They have more time to consult if they have already uploaded. It's like a motherly touch to them. At the same time, some universities have online learning management system like Piper, Blackboard, you know, that help them in terms of uploading their lecture notes. You know? So it's a matter really of preparedness of the universities and colleges also. And the most highlight of these best practices is the sharing of resources. And that actually in terms of sharing a load, you know, top up uh, in terms of uh, uh, top up with their load, you know, to have a data, borrow gadget in terms of the schools, and of course, sharing resources. And that makes a unique characteristic of, uh, of this uh, of the Filipino phar pharmacy lecturers of the Bayanihan or the community spirit no, among all of, uh, of the faculty and the student. Next slide, please. With this, there are a lot of uh, challenges uh, being identified in our research, no? in the nation nationwide research, that uh, there is really a, a big problem in terms of connectivity and less of resources on some of our, uh, some of the universities and colleges, especially uh, especially those small universities and colleges that we have. Now, now this actually looks into uh, some. Uh, um, adjustment in terms of deliveries and modalities uh, because some of the faculties are being locked down in their provinces they don't have an internet some students are still in their dormitory or in their boarding houses which are quite very picky no? so they they thought that they it's, it's only one week that uh, pandemic will happen but it turns out it becomes two months already no so it's a matter of the delivery and modalities that they can have for accessibility of the students. Now, the coping up no, of the students also becomes also a challenge. No? The, some of them may have difficulties because they are not uh, well-oriented about self-directed learning, but this actually becomes an opportunity to them to learn and becomes an opportunity of a self-directed learning, more time to study of their lecture, no, especially those who are taking the board exam and of course wider learning for students with this these are the challenges and opportunities that affect now with this covid 19 pandemic in our movement our plans at the same time directions in the future and beyond pandemic so in the next slide i uh, i always mention this to everyone that for this together let us change the way we move to the new normal. And thank you very much to Papa and Malaysian Pharmaceutical Society for sponsoring this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Erwin. We're so happy that you are able to join us and uh, deliver your slides uh, presentation. That concludes our webinar as far as the presentation goes. Um, we do actually compile uh, the question submitted earlier by registered participants and also we've seen these questions being asked uh, again uh, in the session in the chat box and I can quickly say that uh, most of the questions centered around the uh, alternative teaching and learning uh, for uh, especially for experiential type uh, 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 teaching and learning, like the practical, uh, also clerk shapes, uh, attachment to hospital and industries. Actually, um, some of the speakers have, uh, have actually highlighted 
this uh, particular issue in their presentations and how they actually overcome or try to overcome or manage the situation in their respective country. Um, if you would like to know more, then uh, I would, uh, would stay, you can uh, stay on and then uh, I'm going to invite uh, Professor Agung to share with us uh, the experience in Indonesia, particularly to the industry-based uh, and also hospital-based teaching and learning uh, and what has been done uh, in the country. Uh, Professor Agung, do you want to... Uh, do you want to take this question? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Haniki, and uh, thank you very much for ladies and gentlemen for the question. I would like to share our experiences here <coughs> in my faculty of pharmacy, Universitas Gajah Mada. It is about uh, professional work, working practices, yeah. Uh, internship yeah, in industry, pharmacies, yeah, or apotek in Indonesia, pharmacies is uh, apotek, yeah. hospitals, and health centers. In my case, uh, yeah, uh, practical works, yeah, it is related to skill-based academic activities. Yeah. It is very difficult to change, to uh, online academic activity. It is different with uh, comparing for uh, comparing to uh, knowledge-based academic activities. For example, lecture and learning is very very easy, more easier than uh, how to say uh, skill-based uh, academic activity. But the important thing how to minimize the gap of uh, learning outcome. Yeah of these uh, courses. In my case, uh, professional working practices, we, uh, we change with sharing content methods. Yeah. We provide videos, yeah, videos of activity in industry, uh, pharmacies, hospitals, health centers, and also presentation. Uh, actually, uh, videos of activity are not enough. So uh, we also combine with presentation. Besides sharing content methods, we also conduct a group sharing. We make discussion groups uh, consisting of uh, supervisor, preceptors, practitioners, and also students who have done professional working practices. So uh, these students already have experiences about professional working practices and also we invite students who have not done uh, how to say uh, professional working practices and we also add with uh, online teaching and learning by practitioners and preceptors ladies and gentlemen it is not enough so after COVID-19 pandemic subsets, we are going to evaluate the learning outcomes achievement. And we provide such class program, ladies and gentlemen, and there will be a hands-on workshop at the time of deficiency. I mean, uh, inter-semester, yeah? Uh, inter-semester, uh, how to say, since the holiday to uh, conduct uh, hands-on workshop and class program to minimize the gap of learning outcome achievement. Yeah, I think it is our uh, answer, Dr. Haniki. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, uh, Agung. Yes, definitely. And then uh, in one or two minutes, if I may, the other emerging question is on assessment. Uh, is regarding uh, its fairness and uh, the the way that is conducted. So I would like to address this to Vivian, please. Sure, thanks for that, um, uh, Prof. So uh, essentially with assessments, I mean, this is a really good question around academic integrity. It's something that's globally an issue. Um, so a lot of people are struggling to find out how we can make our assessments um, fair and also to prevent collusion and cheating. Uh, we have some universities are using proctoring um, services, so essentially they're being monitored on webcams. 
Um, we are not doing so because of equity issues and internet issues. Um, in other words, if they are not able to join online, they're not going to be able to do the exam. So we're doing still online exams, but with less technology issues. Um, and with other assessments, we try to use question banks. So with question banks, um, it will mean that not every student will get the same question, but it will also mean that whatever questions that you put in will be thrown out for um, the future because students can take photos and so on. You also can make variations in questions. So we've done so with slight variations and you'll notice that the students, if they were to copy and cheat, will make errors and it's pretty obvious that they do. We also use text matching um, software, so like turn it in and things, so you can match if students were to cheat and copy each other. It's not a um, easy task for sure. Different universities might do it slightly differently. I think at the end of the day, I posted this in the question and answer. If it's a pharmacy program, these are going to be professionals. And I think what you want to try and instill in them is not focus on the cheating and how to prevent it, but to tell the pharmacy students that this is part of a professional value that being having good integrity, professionalism, and you're one of the most trusted health professionals um, around the world, um, that you need to start with these values early on. Um, so that you, there's research out there to show that if you have disciplinary actions when you are out in the profession, to, when you look back at them, these ha have had issues during the undergraduate years. So there's research to show this in the medical faculty. So I think it's really important that we have those values instilled in them. Great, thank you so much, Vivian. I think with that, um, I would like to again uh, thank all the speakers uh, to FAPA, Secretariat, and also to Monash University, particularly uh, for this webinar session. And do uh, claim your webinar certificate by following the steps in the slides here. If you have any questions, you can uh, email us at event.fapa at gmail.com. And last but not least, uh, 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 another friendly reminder uh, for the FAPA Congress uh, in Kuala Lumpur, 6th to 10th of April 2021, next year, hopefully. So we'll see you all there. Bye-bye.